Trigonometry is one of those subjects that a lot of us see in school and think, when am I ever going to use this in real life? So this series is about some of the ways that trig can actually be very useful in creative coding. Let's start with a bit of background information. Some people will say trigonometry is all about triangles, some will say it's about angles in general, others will say it's related to circles, and some will even say it's all about waves. And all of those are right, it's about all of those things, but in the world of creative coding, there are basically two main situations where we're going to use trig. The first is when we have an angled line segment, and we want to find the lengths of its horizontal and vertical components. The other situation is when we want to make something that oscillates back and forth in some way. And to be clear, when I talk about using trigonometry, I'm specifically talking about sine, cos, and tan. These are called trig ratios, and they're math operations that take a single value, similar to something like square root, factorial, or absolute value. And they're also built-in JavaScript functions, but we'll get into that a little later. Anyway, the trig ratios all kind of work the same way. If we had a right angled triangle containing the given angle, sine tells us the ratio of the opposite side to the hypotenuse, cos tells us the ratio of the adjacent side to the hypotenuse, and tan tells us the ratio of the opposite side to the adjacent side. And because these are all ratios in the form of one side length divided by another, it doesn't matter how large or small the triangle is. That's why we can calculate these ratios with just the angle. So if we have a line segment where we know the angle and the length, we can treat it like the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle. And then we can use sine and cos to find the lengths of the opposite and adjacent components respectively, which usually represent the vertical and horizontal components, but it depends on the context. Anyway, you'll notice that we don't need to use tan in order to calculate these components, so that's one of the main reasons why sine and cos tend to be used a lot more often. Okay, I think that's enough information to get us started, so let's get into today's project. We're going to make an analog clock. These can be harder to read compared to a digital clock, but they give a more clear visual sense of time, and they're also very clean and elegant. So that'll be nice. We're going to be using p5.js for this project, as well as all the other trig projects we'll be working on. It's a JavaScript library that basically makes it easier to do audiovisual stuff, mostly using an HTML5 canvas. So it's very popular among artists, educators, and other creative types. And there's a p5 editor available in the browser, so we can get started without any installations or anything like that. P5 is a bit like MS Paint in some ways. When we're drawing shapes on the canvas, we start by selecting the colors and attributes we want, and then we just need to give it the coordinates and dimensions of the shapes we want to draw, and they'll all have the same attributes until we tell it otherwise. Anyway, you might notice that when we make a new sketch, it starts with these two built-in functions, setup and draw. Setup will be called once right at the start, and then after that, draw will be called on every frame forever, so like 60 times a second by default. It's a lot of times. So any code that's going to make something animate or change is usually going to be inside the draw function. There are a few other built-in P5 functions that we might use later, but aside from that, it's all just the same JavaScript that we know and love. So outside these functions, I'm going to start by assigning some constants for our canvas dimensions. This will make it easier to refer to them throughout the sketch, and we'll add more variables up here later, but for now, let's just refer to W and H within our setup function, which is where we're creating the canvas. Within the draw function, we're currently just redrawing this light gray background on every frame, which is not really very interesting. Since we're going to be making an analog clock, we might as well start by just putting a big circle right in the middle of the screen. So the center of the circle will be located at half the width and half the height, and we'll just give it a diameter of let's say 600 pixels for now. You'll notice by default the fill color is white and there's a one pixel black outline, but we can change all this if we want. But for now I want to talk about how we're going to draw the hour markers. And that's already going to require the use of trigonometry, so let's go back to the drawing board for a sec. We're going to have 12 of these hour markers that are evenly spaced out, so we know the angle of each of them. It's going to be 360 degrees divided by 12, which is 30 degrees. So relative to the 12, we can figure out what all of their angles are going to be. 
We also know what the radius is because we get to decide how large we want to make the clock. And so basically we can use sine and cos to figure out the x and y components of each of these hour markers. Of course, this is assuming that the center is actually at 0, 0, which it's not. It's more like w over 2, h over 2. So we can just add those components onto the x and y that we've already found. Okay, so going back to the code, we can just use a for loop that's going to take this angle from 0 to 360, incrementing by 30 degrees at a time. And then we can calculate our x and y components using the formulas we came up with before. So basically starting with the center coordinates and then adding on the trig stuff that we calculated before. Something to notice is that for x, we're adding on the horizontal component, whereas for y, we're subtracting the vertical component. The reason is because down is actually the positive direction for y on a canvas, which is different from a graph where up is the positive direction for y. So that's kind of one of the more common gotchas in working with P5 or working with Canvas in general. It's just something we'll have to get used to. Okay, so we'll just draw a circle for now for each of the hour markers, but we can always change this. And we're going to want to assign a value to a clock radius so that this code will actually work. And now we notice that it doesn't actually look great. This doesn't look like what we might expect. And the reason for that is we're not using degrees. As you may know, there are actually two types of units that are commonly used to measure angles, degrees and radians. Technically, radians are more meaningful, but degrees are a lot easier to use, so that's what we're going to stick with for now. So this is kind of similar to when you're using a scientific calculator and there's like a DRG button we can use to switch between the modes. Here we just need to say angle mode degrees anytime we're going to use this. And because we want to keep it on this mode throughout the entire sketch, I'm going to put that right in the setup. Okay, great. Everything at least looks like it's in the right place now. It still looks a bit bland, a little boring, but we can always jazz it up a little later. And that's probably going to be the easy part. For now, let's talk about how we can actually get the hands on this clock. I'm going to start by making a new function. I'm going to call it draw hand. And basically it's going to accept two parameters, the hand angle and the hand radius. So basically where we want it to point and how far we want it to go. We're going to use the same formulas that we used for our hour markers to calculate the coordinates of where the hand is going to end, because we know it's going to start at the center. And then for now, let's just draw a line that goes from the center to the end of the hand. So to test this out, let's just say it's two o'clock. So we'll have kind of a shorter hand pointing at the 60 degrees, which is where the two o'clock hour marker is. And then we'll have a slightly longer hand pointing right at the 12, which is an angle of zero. And that looks good. Yeah, it looks like everything is where we expect it to be. So once again, looks a little boring. We can improve that later. But for now, let's just get our hour, minute, and second hand working. In other words, we want to get the actual time. We can do that with traditional JavaScript, but it can be a bit of a pain. And this is where we're going to start to really see the strength of P5 in action. In P5, we have these really nice built-in time functions. We can just call hour, minute, and second, and it'll tell us the hour, minute, and second, respectively, just in the form of an integer. So that's very convenient compared to the traditional JavaScript way of doing this. I'm also going to use another built-in P5 function called map, which is basically going to take a number that's within some given initial range, and it's going to scale it up according to a different range that we want it to now be in. So for the hour, normally it would go from 0 to 24, and that would represent two revolutions around the clock. So now we're going to say that it goes from 0 to 720 degrees. For the minute angle, normally it goes from 0 to 60. Now we want it to go from 0 to 360. And same thing for the second angle. And we could do all this just using traditional math formulas, and that would be totally fine. But this way, it's maybe a little more clear to the reader. But anyway, it's up to you. OK, so now we can just call the draw hand function for the hour, minute, and second. And there we go. We pretty much have a working clock at this point. It just doesn't look very nice. <laughs> And there are a couple of issues with the motion as well. So 
There are three main improvements I want to make now. The first is the clock face itself. I want to change up the hour markers and background. The second is that I want to improve the look of the actual hands. They're looking a bit flimsy, very thin, and I think we can make those a little nicer. The third thing is the motion of the clock hands, but we'll get to that. For now, we want to start with the clock face. I think in a lot of cases, minimalism tends to be more elegant. So I'm going to start by getting rid of the circle behind the clock, and then we'll talk about how we can improve the hour markers. So I'm going to make a new set of coordinates here for each of the hour markers that's just a little further out than the initial X and Y that we calculated. And we could use this as the location for the numbers to actually label the hour markers, or we could just label some of them like we see on some clocks. But I kind of prefer the look of it without the numbers, so I'm not going to include those, you're certainly welcome to, but I'm actually going to use these outer coordinates for a different purpose. Instead of making each hour marker a circle, I'm going to make it a little line segment. Oh nice, it's already looking more elegant, but let's make these a lot wider. I think 30 pixels looks pretty good, but I don't really like the roundedness on the end, which is what P5 uses by default for a thick line segment like this, so we can just tell it to cap it off in a square way. Okay, now that's looking pretty good, but it's making the hands look pretty weird at the same time, so maybe let's tackle those now. If you think about a physical analog clock, normally the hands on those are often tapered, which is not the most straightforward thing to do in P5. There are a few ways we can do it, and basically the strategy we're going to use is for each of these hands, instead of them being one straight line or one straight line segment, we're going to make it just like a hundred little dots, and then they'll start thick and we'll make them more and more thin. So we'll go back to our draw hand function, and instead of using the line command, we're gonna make this a loop with a bunch of circles inside. So we're gonna use another for loop for this. This time it's gonna be a little weird because the iterator is gonna go from zero to one, and it's just gonna do it in very small steps. So I'm just gonna use this variable i as like a weight to say how much of the actual final coordinates do you want versus how much of the center coordinates, and that'll just allow it to travel out from there. I'm just using math for this, but there is a P5 built-in function called LERP, which I think stands for linear interpolation. And we could use that here, but the math isn't too complicated, so I'm just gonna keep it like this for now. Okay, so the hands are working. They're telling the proper time here. They look a little weird. <laughs> so basically, the first thing I wanna do is make them actually taper. So maybe they'll start as 20 pixels and go down to five pixels. Okay, nice. So these are looking very sharp, but they still look like a bunch of overlapping circles. So we're just gonna remove the stroke and paint them a solid color. And maybe let's actually make that a parameter in this function as well, so that we can specify whether we want some of these to be a different color. Oh, and one thing we'll wanna keep in mind is just like in that MS Paint comparison we looked at earlier, if we change some of the attributes, like if we say we don't want any stroke or if we want the fill color to be something different, that'll affect everything that's drawn after that, including the hour markers on the next iteration of drawing. So if we wanna prevent that and actually make changes to the attributes, but then revert them back to whatever they were before, that's where we can use this push and pop syntax. So you can think of there being sort of like a style stack, and when we push, we're on a new layer of it, and then when we pop, we go back down to the previous layer. So that just ensures that it doesn't mess up any other part of the sketch. And like we said before, we want another parameter for specifying the color of each of these hands, and I'll just give that a default value of zero so that it can be an optional argument. And if we don't include it, it'll just be black. And then for the second hand, let's just make it red because that's kind of a conventional thing you see on some clocks. Okay, so I'd say this is looking pretty good. We might want to change up the colors. That's really up to you. But I would say right now, the main thing I'm having an issue with is the motion. I don't really like how these hands are just very rigid. We want them to flow a lot more smoothly. So the first thing I'm going to do is to try to smooth out the hour angle. So let's say it's 630. We don't want the hour hand to just be pointing at the six. We want it to be like between the six and the seven. So I'm actually gonna say instead of just hour, it's gonna be hour plus minute divided by 60. And this should work out just perfectly so that once minute goes from 59 to zero, 
hour is getting incremented at the same exact time that minute is going back down to zero. So this should work out nice and smooth. And then similarly for minute, we're gonna add on minute plus second divided by 60. Okay, great. So now we see that these are moving a lot more smoothly, which is great, it's what we're looking for. But there's still one more issue, which is that the second hand is very rigid. And if you think about most analog clocks, uh, it's kind of seen as like a mark of quality if the second hand just continuously flows instead of taking more quantized ticks. Okay, so this actually might be the toughest part of the project because there are a couple issues in terms of making this more smooth. One way we might think to solve this is to basically just do the same thing for the second angle. So we actually do have a function called millis, which represents the milliseconds, but the problem is it's a little bit different than these other time functions. So if we try this out, something we'll notice now is that the second hand kind of jerks every second. The reason is because the millis function isn't just telling us the current time in milliseconds, it's telling us the number of milliseconds that have passed since we started this sketch. So unlike hour, minute, and second, it's cumulative, it keeps adding on, whereas something like second just goes from zero to 59 over and over again. Millies doesn't just go from zero to a thousand over and over again, it goes past a thousand and keeps counting. So then you might say, okay, well, if this is like doubling up on our seconds, let's just get rid of the second part of it and just do the millies divided by a thousand. And fair point, I mean, that definitely makes it a lot more smooth. The problem is that this always starts at zero instead of the actual second that the time is. So it's not gonna be synced up with our hour and minute hand. So that's no good either. So if we want the second hand to just continuously move, we would probably need some kind of solution where we store the second value the moment we start the sketch and then use millis together with that value. I'm gonna leave that as an exercise to the viewer, but for now, we're gonna use a technique called easing, which is often used in the context of motion, but more generally, it basically just insmoothens the transition from one state to another. There are a lot of ways to code this. In fact, it could probably be the topic of an entire video series, and maybe it will be. But for now, I just wanna keep it very simple. So we're actually gonna put the second angle into the global scope with the rest of these variables up here. And we're gonna make this easing weight constant as well, which we'll talk about in a second. But basically, instead of the second angle being the thing that we just calculate directly from the second function, instead that's gonna represent the goal that we eventually want the second angle to reach. And then we'll calculate the second angle as a weighted average between its current value and the goal value that we want it to reach. This is kind of similar to how we made the tapered hands earlier. And now we can just adjust the easing weight value if we wanted to make the motion tighter or more gradual. So around here, it's starting to look pretty smooth, but you're probably also noticing there are a couple issues with this. Number one, when we first start the sketch, the second hand has to sort of find its value. And so it starts at zero and then circles around. So we want to avoid that. We'll talk about that in a sec. And then the other issue is when it transitions from one minute to the next, it goes all the way back around the clock, which is not really great. So the first of these two issues might seem pretty straightforward to fix. We might think, well, why don't we just initialize the second angle as the value it's supposed to be, like the initial goal that it should have. And the problem with that is that this stuff at the top is getting executed before P5 is actually loaded. So if we wanna assign this value to second angle, we have to first declare it at the top, and then within the setup function, we can actually give it the value that we want. And now that seems to fix the issue. This is much nicer, it's starting at the right place. However, we still have this other issue of what happens when we go from one minute to the next. The reason this is happening is because second goes from zero to 59 and then back down to zero. So instead of just continuing around the 12, it goes back counterclockwise to zero. 
And that's kind of a problem. So one way we could fix this would be to actually add on the minute value times 60 so that as second increments from 59 to zero, minute also goes up by one. So we're adding 60 back on. So it actually goes from 59 to 60 instead of 59 to zero. That also means that this number is just gonna get larger and larger, but that's okay because the angle is just gonna keep going around and around. It doesn't really matter if it's zero degrees, 360 degrees, 720 degrees, etc. It just keeps looping around. Okay, so this is ultimately working, but we're noticing that the moment we start it up, it kind of freaks out a little bit. And that's because we haven't updated what we're doing in the setup function. So just to keep this all very consistent, I'm just going to make a new function. It's going to be called get second. And it's just going to be the thing that we call in the setup function, as well as on this line where we're getting our second goal. OK, so that solves the problem we were having with the initialization, as well as the traversal from one minute to another. However, we would still have a problem when we're going from one hour to the next. So if we want to fix that, we could use a very similar strategy. And then basically the next issue is going from one day to the next, and then one month to the next, one year to the next. So this formula could end up being very complicated if we wanted to actually fix all the possible issues. But you know, it's up to you what level of depth you want to get into there. Okay, so at this point we have a very nice working analog clock. It looks, you know, not bad. It's pretty minimalistic. Some might even say a bit boring. So from here, if you want to, you can give whatever kind of artistic flair you want to this project. We could switch up the color palette if you want. We could even give it a cool background, like from an image, maybe a wood grain or a marble or something cool like that. We could change the easing style on the second hand to make it kind of overshoot the second marker a little bit, like you may have seen on some analog clocks. We could add a little digital display like you might see on some watches. We could try arranging the hour markers in more of a square shape instead of a circle. We could even do something completely outrageous, like making the hands of the clock all wavy. Anyway, it's completely up to you how you want to continue to improve this project. If you do end up making something that you're really happy with and maybe you want to show off, feel free to share it in the Coding Serenity Discord. One of the really nice benefits of the P5 editor is how easy it makes it to actually share these projects with others. So feel free to drop a link in the Coding Serenity Discord. Great job today, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.